Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Jacob Shapiro Podcast. As usual, I am your host, Jacob Shapiro, coming to you live from Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, I was here for an event earlier this week. Uh, Rob and I recorded Friday morning. We talk about the micro geopolitics of Fargo, the micro geopolitics of Briançon, some a French town that Rob was in over his vacation, and explore some questions, not answers, questions really that we have about Brazil and X and Lula and uh, Elon Musk facing off. Uh, if you want to talk about anything you heard in this podcast, you can email me at jacob at cognitive.investments. Otherwise, take care of the people you love. I'm headed to the airport. Cheers and see you out. There we go. Okay, after some difficulties, good morning from Fargo, North Dakota. It's 7-Eleven on a Friday morning here. Uh, Rob, tell me you're you're probably somewhere in France. Absolutely lovely. <laughs> uh, just sitting in my office in Paris. I just had lunch with Shane, former podcast guest. Hello to Shane. I know he's probably going to listen to this at some point. What did you guys have for lunch? Where did you go? We oh, I was super, super French. We both had tartare. He had beef tartare. I had salmon tartare with salad and frites. So pretty, uh, pretty, 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 pretty Parisian style. Pretty, pretty heavy for a for a lunch meal. Beef. T- I mean, just some raw meat. Meat. I guess you you go into your afternoon Parisian nap after you have your nice uh, helping of raw meat and and frites. Well, I can't help but think of that scene from Wall Street where he drops down the beef tartare in front of him, says lunch. You know, enjoy your lunch, kid. <laughs> All right, well, I, I was going to be jealous, but I'm not so jealous of you guys eating tartare at lunch, so keep it up. Um, I'm, I'm recently back from vacation. Rob is recently back from vacation. Obviously, I'm, I'm on the road traveling. By the way, I feel fine, but for some reason, I, I woke up this morning. My voice sounds like I could sing bass two in a Russian choir. I'm, I'm ready to hit those really low B flats in the Rachmaninoff Vespers for that really niche uh, idea to the three of you who will recognize what I just said. Um, so just enjoy, just enjoy the bass voice today. I'm enjoying listening to myself talk. I always enjoy listening to myself talk. Um, so let's let's dive in a little bit, Rob. I want to start with our favorite segment, which is micro geopolitics, because I've I've been to Fargo a couple times now, and I have not yet given Fargo um, the micro geopolitics treatment. As usual with these little segments. Um, I thought it was, you know, I was kind of expecting to be interested in Fargo because I've been here a couple times, but it was more interesting than I thought. And it was also, um, when I got here, I was full of Fargo trivia. So I was talking to some of my hosts and be like, hey, did you know this about Fargo? Did you know this about Fargo? And they didn't know any of it. So I'm even educating um, the people who are from Fargo here. Um, The town began in 1871, and there were actually two Fargos originally. There was Fargo on the Prairie and Fargo in the Timber. Um, And the original name for the town was not Fargo, it was Centralia. It was renamed Fargo in honor of William George Fargo, who was a director and financial backer of the Northern Pacific Railroad and also a partner in the Wells Fargo Express Company, uh, also big big in the American Express Company as well. As far as I can tell, he actually didn't do much in Fargo. Like He didn't come here. It wasn't some place that he spent a lot of time. He lived in New York. He was mayor of Buffalo for a while. But people wanted to honor him because uh, he was that director of the Northern Pacific Railroad. And the reason that Fargo exists where it is is because of the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, this is also some interesting history as well. Uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad Company got a charter from then President Abraham Lincoln in 1864 to build a railroad from Lake Superior to Puget Sound. So from the Midwest all the way out um, towards the Pacific. Um, And it took them six years to get started, but they got started in 1870 and they eventually identified the Fargo-Moorhead area. So Moorhead is the twin city to Fargo. Lots of twin cities in this Minnesota, North Dakota area um, as the place that they were going to build a railroad bridge across the Red River. Um, and I'm actually looking out at the Red River Valley right now from my hotel room here in downtown Fargo. Um, a couple words about the Red River Valley because it's actually very interesting. Um, it's one of the most fertile areas in the United States. Um, the Red River Valley formed after the retreat of a glacial lake which drained away about 10,000 years ago. Um, it also is one of the most flood prone areas in the United States because um, the Red River, it, it goes from south to north. It flows from south to north. And as a result of that, and as a result of its low gradient, um, as temperatures get warmer in the spring, the ice melts 
further south because that's where temperatures are warmer and that creates these ice dams on the river itself which in turn creates frequent flooding. Um, so the combination of the glacial lake retreat and the constant flooding has created some of the most fertile land in all of the United States and all of the world. Um, I put a really great map of where land is fertile in the United States actually in a little post that, that summed up all my thoughts about Fargo. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes if people want to see it. Um, the, the flooding was actually, the, the Native Americans, according to NDSU archives, used to say that the Red River overflowed its bank, banks every, every spring, and so the Red River Valley would become a sea in the spring. And I think that maybe explains why there wasn't a permanent, a very permanent settlement here in Fargo. It's not like some of these other Native American towns and places where you had a permanent Native settlement. The Natives were here, um, but because of the flooding, they sort of have to, they had to move around. Um, so they did some farming and they did some hunting and gathering in this area, but they also had to be mobile because if you just sat here next to the Red River, eventually things were going to flood and they were going to destroy everything that you built. Um, besides all that, though, the Northern Pacific Railroad needed to get across the Red River, and they thought this was the highest point at which they could build the railroad. So they, so they decided, okay, we're going to build here. Um, the two Fargo start because Fargo... Um, uh, what is it? Fargo in the prairie? On the prairie? I get the pronouns mixed up. Fargo on the prairie um, was where the Northern Pacific Railroad engineers basically started. Um, and it was run almost like an army camp. There were army officers that accompanied the railroad engineers. It was very uh, clean. It was well laid out. It's located roughly in the area uh, occupied by Main Avenue from 4th to, 7th, uh, 4th to 7th Streets here in Fargo. Um, it eventually attracted a lot of Norwegian immigrants because they liked the fertile soil and they were willing to put up with Fargo's terrible cold winters. Um, Fargo in the timber is actually a little more interesting. So some of the railroad construction workers who had come from uh, Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, which is roughly an hour away, um, decided rather than going home for the winter, they just wanted to hunk down in a camp near where they were building the town um, rather than go home to Detroit Lakes. And so Fargo in the timber becomes one of these towns sort of like Deadwood where it's lawless and anybody can do whatever they want and there's saloons and bars all over the place. Um, interestingly enough though, a lot of the early politicians from Fargo did not come from Fargo on the prairie. They came from Fargo in the timber. Uh, the first mayor of Fargo was a former steamboat owner who ran a saloon in Fargo in the timber. Uh, Another guy who became the mayor of Bismarck uh, ran a saloon in Fargo in the Timber. Another guy also uh, was the first postmaster for Fargo. Um, eventually, the well-to-dos don't really like what's going on in Fargo in the Timber, and they, they clear it. Um, but for this sort of 20, 30-year period, you have this you know, sort of Fargo, the Midwestern town that you would think of today, and Fargo, the Western saloon outpost um, living next to each other. As a result of um, some of that free spirit, maybe, one of the things that Fargo was known for in the late 1800s was being the divorce capital of the world. Um, so North Dakota had some very, um, some very easy laws about how you could get divorces. You had to come and sort of declare your intent as soon as you got here and spend a little bit of time and you could get a divorce, sort of like the way Vegas is now, as I understand it. Um, and so people would travel from far and wide, even apparently from Europe, to come to Fargo just to get divorces. And until 1899, they were doing like more divorces than any other place in the United States in general. Um, eventually, and the reason Fargo got most of it was because they were the Northern Pacific outpost. They were the place where people came. If you were coming out this direction, you were coming on a Northern Pacific Railroad and you were getting to Fargo. So that's why Fargo picks up that reputation. Eventually, Fargo citizens say, enough is enough. We are well-to-do Norwegian bachelor farmers. We don't want any of this. So in 1899, they lobby the North Dakota government and they get rid of the laws that allowed people to get divorces there. Um, 1890 sees the founding of North Dakota Agricultural College, which eventually becomes North Dakota State University. It is North Dakota's land-grant university. Uh, and Rob, you probably know I'm a Cornell alum, so I have a soft spot for, for land-grant universities. Um, it's the second largest employer in Fargo today. It accounts for roughly 3% of Fargo's workforce. Um, and I travel around a lot, and you know, I've even given a couple lectures at NDSU. It's a really, really impressive university. And I think the, the combination of rail transport and of uh, the university and of um, the fertility of the soil is what creates the secret sauce that has made Fargo a really successful 
um, small city here over the last hundred plus years. Um, it is not just agriculture. There are a lot of farmers around and there's a lot of agricultural interests here, uh, but it's also become sort of a mini ag tech hub. Um, some people might know the name Doug Burgum. He's the governor of North Dakota. He seemed to be vying for the vice presidential spot at one point. He created something called Great Plains Software, um, which was bought by Microsoft in 2001. At the time, it was Microsoft's most expensive acquisition ever. And Microsoft actually has a big base here, uh, still doing lots of ag tech. Um, there's also always been some manufacturing here in Fargo. Um, so early in the 1900s, um, there was a company that manufactured or distributed 29% of all the Buicks in the United States. There was a regional Ford assembly plant that was here for 50 years from roughly 1917 to 1956. Uh, today, one of Fargo's biggest employers is Marvin Windows. Uh, uh, regular listeners to the podcast will know that we recently renovated my house in New Orleans before I started coming to Fargo. All Marvin Windows in the house. I don't even get paid for that little advertisement that gets put in there. Um, so it's a really co interesting constellation of interests and things. And I, since I've started coming to Fargo in the last couple of years, I get a, I, I think it's overwrought to call it an Austin, Texas vibe because it's not going to be Austin, Texas. It doesn't have um, the size. It doesn't have the weather to attract people. But there is an energy here that you don't feel in most towns. It feels young. It feels growing. Real estate is constantly expanding. People are building all over the place. You can feel some of the energy here, especially with the reinvigorated um, downtown area. Um, the last thing I wanted to say here, though, was that, and this made it super interesting for somebody who lives in New Orleans, is that that flooding issue is still a major issue for Fargo. It never went away. Um, and Fargo and Moorhead together have joined forces to try and finally do something about that with something they're calling the Fargo-Moorhead Metropolitan Area Stormwater Diversion Channel Project. Um, I put a couple maps in the little report I did about this, but basically they're trying to build a massive channel around the city so that if flooding hits a certain level, they can just divert all of the water around the city rather than water flooding the city. And this is a really present concern. There was massive flooding in 96 and 97. Uh, they barely escaped huge flooding damage in 2008, 2009, when new records were set for levels on the Red, Red River with a combination of precipitation and ice melt. Um, it's an absolutely fascinating project. It's the first time, at least according to the, the Department of Transportation website about this, that the Army Corps of Engineers is working as part of a public-private partnership, so they're involved. But some Israeli construction company got the contract to do this. And I've been asking around here, Rob, and nobody can tell me how an Israeli construction firm is here in Fargo building this massive floodwater diversion project. So if any of my listeners can tell me the story here um, and not kill me afterwards, I'm really curious to know how this Israeli company got this contract, because I was kind of taken aback when I saw who they were. Um, They've been talking about this project for a long time now, but they've begun work on it. And they're talking about substantial completion by 2027. If you're interested in water management and these kinds of epic infrastructure projects, it's worth taking a look at because it's a really, really ambitious project. As with all of these sorts of water imp infrastructure projects, I'm sure there are going to be terrible long-term consequences. Um, this is certainly true of the Mississippi and New Orleans, we know this extremely well by preventing flooding. They've um, really set themselves up for really disaster, I think, in the future and the destruction a lot of, of the lot of the local, um, not the local topography, but you know what I'm trying to say. They're really ruining the landscape in some ways and the landscape is having to adapt to it because the, the river was used to moving back and forth, not to being in one place. Um, so I have some fears about that, but I think it also goes to the spirit of Fargo itself, because I can tell you in New Orleans, we're not doing anything innovative about our problems there with water. We're just continuing to do what we did before, whereas Fargo is trying new things. And they're doing these interesting public-private partnerships and, and infrastructure projects to try and protect what they've built in Fargo in general. Um, so the, the last thing I wanted to say, and this has nothing to do with Fargo the town, but has everything to do with William Fargo. As I said, he, he was one of the people who helped found American Express, which began as a freight forwarding company in Buffalo. I don't know if you knew that, Rob. He eventually broke off and started something called Wells Fargo and Company in 1852. And the reason they broke off was, was because the American Express partners did not want to extend their operations to California, but William Fargo did. And so the original Wells Fargo company was created to facilitate an express business between New York and San Francisco by the way of the Isthmus of Panama 
and the Pacific Coast. And I'm actually reading David McCullough's book about the creation of the Panama Canal right now. So when I was doing this research, I was really interested in that. Um, there was no transcontinental railroad yet. So the quickest way to get to the San Francisco gold rush was to get down to Panama, cross Panama, and then get up that way. And that was what he wanted to do. Uh, that was what Wells Fargo and Company was started as. Um, and the company offered banking services, which included buying gold and selling paper bank drafts, um, and the delivery of gold and anything else valuable along this route. Um, it made me feel a little inferior, Rob, because here we are doing podcasts and you know doing research from our computers. I'm sitting in a hotel and in uh, in Fargo, and uh, this guy's like he's creating companies to like deliver gold from uh, New York to San Francisco by way of Panama. Uh, maybe we should all have a little bit more of William G. Fargo's uh, energy. So anyway, that's my microgeopolitics of Fargo. Anything you want to pick out there? No, I mean it sounds uh, it sounds great. Um, I think that's. Uh... That's probably the longest anyone who's not from Fargo has talked about Fargo without mentioning the movie. So I congratulate you. Yeah, I, I was trying not to. I was trying not to mention the movie. I, one of the things I liked about it from our microgeopolitics segment is that, you know, with some of the previous places that we've talked about, and I think you're going to tell us a little bit about where you were um, on vacation, is you can see in the past what a town looks like today. Like some of our previous ones, like um, that water park town that I was in, it was always a theme park for people to go to. Um, and the interesting thing to me about Fargo was the, that most of its past doesn't correspond with its presence. Like I said, because of that, that flooding issue, there weren't big communities here. It wasn't until you get the combination of, okay, they want to build a railroad across the Red River, and you have this manifest destiny ideology in the United States pushing west, and you have the fertile soil, that you get people willing to take the risk of living near that kind of flooding and building some kind of permanent town there. Um, so in that and this is true of a lot of places in the West um, because the Native Americans are not there anymore and the history has been erased or people don't remember it. But this is an interesting place to me because um, Fargo's geopolitics pre-1871 and pre the railroad precluded any of the kind, precluded this being the type of regional center that it has become right now. So in that sense, Fargo is an incredibly young place. It has only served this role um, since the 1870s, and it only serves that role in part because humans decided, decided to build something here, a railroad, and things build up around that. Um, so it, it goes to show you how geopolitics actually can change in a relatively short amount of time. This is not a return to what Fargo was before. It's Fargo is something sort of qualitatively different than it was um, pre um, European and American settlers getting here. And it sounds like that the geographical constraints were sort of overcome and a new process was kickstarted because of a deliberately political decision. Is that a nice way to summarize it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I actually said this in the, in the little write-up, but I think it does bear mentioning that there was, there was a treaty that the United States signed with some of the local Native American tribes here. Um, that said that they were never going to cross the Red River at this particular place, um, that everything west of this was supposed to go to natives. Um, and of course, when the surveyors from the Northern Pacific Railroad came out here, they were walking up and down the river and they said, eh, this is the best This is the best part. So we're just gonna ignore the treaty and we're just gonna start building there. I think we're both laughing to keep from shame because every one of these stories, and this is probably true of every single American town, but it's I guess it's starker when you move west because it's closer in time to history and maybe we know a little bit more about it, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I also just wanna say that you know there were people here before the railroad got here and like so many stories in American history, the railroad displaced the people who lived here before that. So. But just to be clear, neither of our ancestors were in America at this time. We have our hands clean. Oh, <laughs> no, my my grandmother's family was here at that time. They were not they were not moving west. They were in Pennsylvania, as far as I know. Uh, one of them was uh, apparently a a, a a pastor, a preacher. I'm I'm a Jew. I don't know what the right word is, but he was a union chaplain or something like that. So uh, he was not not out west, but. Uh, I at least had one family, uh, one one branch of the family was at least here in the United States by then. So, anyway, Rob, you want to tell us about where you were on vacation because you were saying it also had some interesting historical um, affiliations that you wanted to talk about. Sure, um, and I didn't do nearly the level of research that that you did on Fargo, um, but 
I think it is worth talking about because it is geopolitically in one of the more interesting places I've ever been. And you could still see some of that today. So where we were was a city called Briançon, which is in the very southeast part of France. It's in the very southern part of the French Alps. And the reason why this town is interesting, it's a very small place, population 12,000. And you can really get a sense that um, you can't have much denser populations than that in that area just because of the mountains. Like you just can't build, you know, the sufficient density of housing. So this is a tiny, tiny place, but um, geographically, it is one of the most important places in Europe, I think it's fair to say, because it is literally the gateway to France from Italy, south of the Alps. So if you're going to bring an army from Italy into France or vice versa, it has to go through this valley. And you can really get a feel for that if you go hiking southeast of the of the of the town Briançon where we were because you can physically see like there's one way in and one way out of this valley and that's where the town is so it was really fascinating because there are so many layers of history the town itself is very famous for a uh, hilltop fortress that was designed and built by Vauban the famous French military architect who designs the defensive structures really all over the country and kind of in many ways defines the boundaries of France because he was building the bastions of, of defense along all of those frontiers. But there's a huge and well-preserved sort of series of uh, castles and crenellations and a whole village that they built within this just to service the town. So this is a you know, 1690, I think it was built. So that's the area where the era we're talking about, Louis XIV. But um, but just visually, this this uh, complex of fortresses just dominates the landscape in the center of this valley. You have to drive right past it, even today, to get in and out. And you can just see, like Caesar wrote about this uh, town specifically in the Gallic Wars. You know, about it being such a linchpin. Um, so, uh, and, and fast forward to more recent times, you can go hiking, you know, within a few miles of where the Vauban fortress complex is, and you can still see the concrete bunkers from when the French were dug in during World War II. Uh, and they actually, uh, very famously resisted the, um, the German advance at this point because it was such a defensible position. So just layer upon layer of, uh, of history and evidence of what an important place this was, this little podunk town, just because of the geography, just because physically it's the way in and the way out. And it's right on the border with present day Italy. So it's kind of interesting because you can go into Italy. We went into Italy for two hours. Um, and you can just walk right in. There's no border patrol. You just go. And it's very striking, first of all, as soon as you cross the border, everyone is talking Italian. I thought it would be a little more of a gray, you know, progression. No, it's it's very black and white. But there's no border control to go in. But if you want to go back into France, it's a pain in the ass. So it's like a 20-minute wait. They check your car. They're looking in the trunk. And, you know, it's interesting because it shows you the way that migration is flowing very <laughs> viscerally in the EU. And actually one of the, I always like to read the local newspapers whenever we go anywhere. That's one of the nice things about France is everywhere you go, there's a little regional paper printed newspaper. And uh, it's a nice way to get a sense for what's going on locally. And some of these places are so small, just to give you a sense this local, this newspaper, which is like the newspaper for uh, Grenoble and like the whole region, it's not just like the town, but it's so like small scale and local. They have, not only do they have the announcements of, oh, a new baby was born, like in the regional newspaper with a picture, like a half page picture of it, this little girl holding the new baby, but they had the same picture two days in a row. 
I read the newspaper on a Friday. And then the next day they had the same thing. Like, oh, just to remind you, Sophia was born yesterday. It's like, come on, people. I know I know things are pretty you know, slow paced here, but there's got to be more news than that. But anyway, in the newspaper, one of the things they pointed out was uh, they had just caught a van full of uh, North African migrants who had been expelled from France and had gone back out of, through Spain and then come around through Italy and tried to get over the this border crossing and what a what a big thing it was and you know it was a it was a big local story so just very interesting to see how how that persists for uh, for years and years and and that just critical choke point in within Europe and even how today even though in theory you have open borders within Europe a place like that is so critical that there's still friction there between Italy and France. And, um, you know, you can really just read all the hundreds of years of, of blood and, uh, and conflict that have happened right in this, you know, small series of, of valleys between, uh, between the French and the Savoyards and, and the Italian city states and stuff. So, yeah, there's two interesting parts of that to me. The first is, I, I think this is true of France in general, which is they are very protective of um, people becoming French, whether it's people getting in or people claiming citizenship in the past. I've talked on the podcast before about how I've been, how I've been doing research on my grandparents and um, you know, exploring European citizenship as a result of where they were from. And you know, they, were, they were from a place that is in present day Ukraine. They lived in Vienna for a long time. Uh, but they made it to France before the war started. And my grandfather is a veteran of the French army. He fought in the French army for as long as it lasted. And that entitled him to employment checks while he was alive, but it did not entitle even his son to French citizenship because he was not born of French parents and he was not born here. So you could have, I mean, he fought for the French army and was not eligible. So that's just an interesting thing. And the thing about local papers um, also gets to my recent personal experience. Um, part of the process of when I was... Um, you know, being named executor for my dad's estate was I had to contact <clears throat> the local paper in the town and have his death printed there and say that I was the person who was in charge of the estate. Like that was what was required by Georgia law. So even though the local paper does not have anything as cute as Sophie or whatever else, those papers apparently do still serve kind of some kind of local role there because I don't, I don't know what you would do if the local paper wasn't there. So I don't know, that just made me think yeah. of it. The, the other thing I just remembered, which is kind of interesting, it's more historical trivia. So you know how the prince of the French royal house was always known as the Dauphin, like the, like mm -hmm. the dolphin, literally? So mm -hmm. apparently, I, I was reading, the whole origin of this is even in the very, very early medieval times when France was extremely fragmented, very quickly the french kings realized that they needed to secure this place to protect themselves from the italian city-states so the the dauphine which is what the region is called today was that was the um the coat of arms of the local lord it was a dolphin on his coat of arms mm. that's why it's called the dauphine and in i think it was in the 1300s already which for france that's super early most things only started to come together you know, a hundred and so plus years later, but the French king uh, struck a deal with the Dauphiné, the Lord of the Dauphiné, where they would essentially the king would inherit the Dauphiné and would become part of the French crown. You know, based in Ile de France, way up north. But the the Lord who needed the money very desperately and was happy to take it, he said one condition is that the future heirs of the French throne must always be known as the Dauphin, the, you know, the dolphin. So, so that's where that, I never knew where that <laughs> came from. Uh, so I, I told my wife that story and she's like, that's a really weird condition to make. <laughs> so, Did you see that uh, FT article that I sent you about the, the great, 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 great grandson of France's last bourbon king and about his name is Charles. Yeah, I did read it. Uh, I did read it this weekend. <laughs> he's waiting. I, he's the he's the Dauphin in waiting, I guess. I don't know. <clears throat> you know, it's funny though. Like, I know that's a joke article. It, it's really, it's good to read. But there are like a weird, there's always a weird little fringe of people who truly do, like it was shocking how late 
true monarchism in France actually stuck around. Like well into the early 20th century, there were serious people who were who were committed to 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 reestablishing a French king. People are eager to give away their liberties. Um, there's not really a good seg. There maybe is a good segue in there, but I can't find it. So we didn't think there was that much interesting going on markets this week, and I've got an agricultural speech in my head, and, and Rob's been doing some other research. So. What we're going to do for the rest of the podcast is we're going to help Rob prep for a conversation he has shortly about Brazil. And the the backdrop for this, if you haven't been following it, and I, I was guilty of poo-pooing this at first because I didn't think it was going to be that big of a deal. But there's a huge confrontation happening between Elon Musk and X and with the Brazilian government. Um, it starts with a justice who, I don't know, you know Brazilian politics a little better than I do. Rob, and your Portuguese pronunciation is better than, than mine. But so, Alexander de Moraes, is that how, how you pronounce that name, Rob? Uh, yeah, close enough. Moraes? Mor Moraes. Mor oh, I wasn't even close. You're, don't, don't be nice. Moraes. Okay. Um, he's had this um, desire to clean up Brazil's information environment. So he's been going after sources of what he thinks of as disinformation. Okay, that seems relatively... Um, uh, uncontroversial. The problem is that a lot of the part of his campaign, which you know he says he's going after accounts that spread dis disinformation or hate speech or threats to democracies, uh, many of his orders have targeted prominent right-wing lawmakers and pundits. Um, so Moraes has become a top enemy of Jair Bolsonaro and a lot of his supporters as well. Um, I don't have enough to evaluate whether that's true or not, but I, I assume you know, it's partisan politics in Brazil, and it wouldn't surprise me if that was part of it. Um, in April, Elon Musk started criticizing this guy on X, calling him a dictator and accusing him of illegally censoring conservative voices. And there's a little bit of a bromance between Musk and Bolsonaro, so you can sort of in interpret this as Musk sticking up um, for his Bolsonaro. For, I think that Musk was even given an award or a medal or something like that by Bolsonaro. I think I have that right. Um, anyway, um, in recent weeks, uh, Marais had been asking X to block certain accounts on the platform, and X was just flat out ignoring them. Um, Marais then threatened to arrest X legal representative in Brazil, and Musk responded by pulling all of X, X's team from the country and firing some of the locals who were working there. At the end of last week, Marais um, ordered um, the blockage of X across the nation because the company lacked a physical presence in Brazil. Um, and he said that people who were using VPNs to circumvent the blackout could face fines of nearly 9,000 a day, which is more than what the average Brazilian um, earns in a year. He also, interestingly, um, froze some of the assets of Starlink in the country. So trying to collect some of the fines against X, he um, froze their assets in Brazil and blocked it from carrying out transactions in the country. He's trying to collect more than $3 million worth of fines against X for ignoring his orders to suspend the accounts. Um, Starlink, obviously, Elon Musk, I believe he owns around 40% of Starlink, but it's a completely different company than X. And it's one that a lot of Brazilians depend on. Um, Starlink has been really important in bringing internet connections to rural parts of Brazil, parts that are in the jungle, parts that don't have the infrastructure to actually connect to the internet. Um, initially, Starlink said it was going to ignore the order to, to halt operations and providing access to X and other things, um, in, uh, or uh, that it was going to ignore the order to block access to X on the internet in some of these places. They have since done an about face, and they've said that they are pursuing um, you know, action against what they regard as illegal treatment uh, of Starlink and freezing their assets and pursuing their legal avenues. Um, but they backtracked a little bit. And it seems like one of the reasons that they backtracked was because if they didn't backtrack, the Brazilian government was going to be able to seize all of their ground stations in the country, which amounts to about 23 different stations in the country. So imagine the Brazilian government seizing that and saying, okay, we are taking this for ourselves. I don't know how that works with the satellites because they probably can't seize the satellites. Um, but they decided to back down as a result of that. Um, shortly before that decision, Musk was on X himself calling Marais an evil tyrant who is a disgrace to the judge's robes. Um, so my instinct was to try and make this a broader conversation about sort of how tech and governments are clashing. We could talk about 
how the EU and Microsoft have been clashing a little bit about the EU not happy with Microsoft handling censorship on its Bing search uh, platform. I didn't know anyone still used Bing, so that was absolutely shocking to me. Um, we could talk about Telegram, we could talk about other things, but I think the Brazil example, Rob, is fertile enough by itself to dive into. Um, where do you want to start here? And it's okay if, if you want to do a classic Jewish maneuver and start with a question, but I, I do think it's a really interesting thing to dive into and one that I didn't think was going to be that big of a deal and, and has become an extremely big deal for Brazil and I think for tech companies in general for future lessons. Um, I think one place to start is specifically the Brazil context because as you said there's something to be learned here or taken away about conflict between private companies, specifically large tech companies and governments, because we're going to see more of this and we can talk about why. But first, I think putting it in the Brazil specific context is important because Brazil is very weird in this way. Like you mentioned, it's a judge uh, that has sort of led this. Um, that's unusual. It's not unusual for Brazil. And I think it's important to sort of acknowledge that. Um, Brazil is not a traditional democracy in the way that we're used to thinking of it. Um, I think a lot of elements of the way Brazilian politics still work today are sort of based on, you know, very uh, deeply rooted ideas of sort of uh, uh, the big man controlling his territory sort of uh, system that they had under the Portuguese, which was a very paternalistic system, a very authoritarian system. And many of that still kind of persists. You know, we forget that Brazil was a military dictatorship until, you know, the 1980s. Um, that's that takes time to work its way out of the system. So I think part of this is Elon Musk finding himself in an arena where, you know, in some cases he's used to dealing with bureaucrats and kind of, you know, weenie career uh, people, you know, who don't have too much individual sway. Um, but in this case, you know, he's sort of clashing with one of the one of the big men in in who have, you know, sort of significant personal power within the Brazilian system that they can wield. So I think that's makes this a little bit of a unique story. Um, zooming out to the broader issue that is beyond Brazil, I think Part of what we're seeing, and this goes to someone like Mark Zuckerberg, who was also in the news, you know, recently saying he's not going to help control disinformation for the 2024 campaign. You know, I'm sure you you saw this um, in the news. This is this is unusual because, and I think some of this has emerged from the fact that the very large tech companies who do find themselves at sort of the nexus of uh, business, but also communications and sort of providing quasi-government, quasi-public services, I should say. And Starlink is obviously part of this. X is obviously part of this. Facebook and Instagram are obviously, you know, fall right into that. Um, a lot of these companies have emerged from a corporate governance standpoint in such a way where founders have outsized um, uh, effective control of the decision making through founder shares and sort of dual share structures, even if they don't have all of the economic control or even close to a majority. So you can have these companies that raise lots of capital, get really, really big in public exchanges and turn into trillion or $2 trillion companies where effectively one guy, and it always is a guy for the most part, um, can wield outsized influences. And you're sort of subject to the whims of someone like an Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, who by definition are sort of weird. Like you don't build a trillion dollar business and be an entrepreneur like that without, you know, if you're just a laid back, cool guy, usually you're weird in some sort of pathological, uh, even if in a positive kind of way. So I think we're going to see more of this. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this how this plays out and whether over time some of this power needs to be wrested away by boards who just get sick of this crap, you know, because obviously the people who are involved at SpaceX and Tesla, um, they, 
must be losing their patience with this guy um, to some extent. So I think it's an interesting area to watch as we look at the friction between governments and big businesses, and especially in this environment of more intervention and sort of states trying to use businesses as tools to clobber each other with, these personalities are going to become more important. Yeah, another part that was interesting as I was looking into this. So, um, and I think this is true of X in general. Like Brazil's social masses are actually primarily on TikTok, and then you know some are using Instagram and, and Facebook. X had an outsized influence in terms of newsmakers and thought leaders, which is still the way I think X is primarily used. Like I still see journalists and thought leaders using X in a meaningful way. Um, and what has happened in just the last week is that people who were using X in Brazil have moved to different platforms. So a lot have moved to Threads, which is related to, um, you know, the for instance, I think it's connected to Instagram. Um, but more of them have actually migrated to something called Blue Sky, which I hadn't even heard of. It actually grew out of Twitter. Um, it's, it's a very similar social media platform, but it's an open source, decentralized protocol developed by, by Blue Sky itself. It became separate from Twitter around 2020 or 2021. And this is remarkable. They gained 2.6 million users, 85% from Brazil as of last week, boosting its total users to over 8 million. Um, so on the one hand, like Musk does have some leverage here, whether it's Starlink or whether it's people using X inside of, of Brazil. Um, but interesting to see that people are flocking to the alternatives. Even President Lula has flocked to the alternatives. He posted on both Blue Sky and Threads on Sunday Good morning, everyone. What do you think of it here? So maybe it's not just Marais. Like maybe he's got Lula in his corner, and I don't know that that's an interesting thing because I, I don't know how how I would think about Lula facing off against Musk. I can actually see some synergies there and also some some differences, and it seemed to be that the differences um, are ruling the day. Yeah, I I forget who we were talking about this with, but someone was asking recently whether we thought um, private companies were going to rival states and sort of this notion that you would have these sort of this science fiction dystopian idea that it's a Blade Runner-esque future and giant corporations just uh, cover the state borders and exert influence over these things and basically become states in and of themselves. And you have these outsized personalities that are basically private businessmen who just, you know, rival presidents and influence. Um, I only am thinking about this because you mentioned Lula facing off against Musk. But tell me that I'm wrong, but I just don't at all buy that theory or that vision of the future. And I don't see it happening simply because states do not have or um, private companies do not have coercive power. And I think in this case, when the state said, hey, we're going to literally physically seize your base stations, then SpaceX and Starlink had to say, OK, <laughs> you know, uncle, like, who are they going to send in the, uh, to, to, to protect the base stations against the Brazilian troops? You know, they're, they're computer engineers. Like, what, what am I missing here on this? Yeah, I mean, it would be boring if I just agreed with you. But but I do, I don't know. I, I'm I'm a little more sympathetic to the dystopian narrative, and I don't think it's that novel. I mean, for the British East India Company, was incredibly powerful and incredibly important. Um, we were in the microgeopolitics we were talking about with Fargo. Somebody like William Fargo, who becomes responsible for getting gold to and from San Francisco via the Isthmus of Panama. That probably created an immense amount of political power for him for a, for a period of time. And I think you can go back and think of individuals like, you know, your Carnegies and your Rockefellers in, in the context of American history who, who wielded significant power um, and eventually came up against somebody like Teddy Roosevelt or who came up against the government who cut them down to size, but for a period of time were that powerful and were sort of governments in and of themselves. And one of the interesting things that tech companies are doing and when I, one of the reasons I sit up in my chair a little bit more straightly to that question, um, it doesn't have to do with Musk facing off against Lula, but look at companies like Microsoft that are basically trying to go off the grid. 
where they're trying to build their own small modular nuclear reactors, where they're trying to build enough energy so that they don't need anything from the government at all. So if you can offshore your tax stuff and to try and hide taxes from the government and you get no energy from the grid and you're not using anything from the grid at all, um, you can try and insulate yourself as much as possible uh, and do th and, and, and you know create some kind of independence of action for yourself. I do think you're right though in the sense that when a government decides that you are a problem and they are going to do something about it, it doesn't matter how vertically integrated you are and how sophisticated your strategies are, like they will come and get it from you. The, the Starlink example though is, is, is a little different because I mean Musk and, and SpaceX could call their bluff there uh, because yes, they can seize maybe the base stations, but they can't seize the satellites unless Brazil has been creating some kind of space fleet that I missed here. Um, so it's basically mutually assured destruction if that's what they want. Um, so that, that I think doesn't particularly work. Um, and and it'll, I, maybe Starlink just decided to back off because they didn't want the headache, but it does seem to me that there is some leverage there because if Starlink says, Let's say Starlink says, okay, we think this is illegal. We're not getting the treatment that we want in Brazilian courts. No more internet in rural and jungle Brazil. No more internet in the, what I think it was 19,000 schools that get internet as a result of Starlink services. Um, I mean, now you're, are you gonna get protests against the Brazilian government? What is the Brazilian government gonna do with that? Like that's an interesting sort of place to go with that. I only have like three minutes, but I just wanna, follow up on one point which I find interesting which is the examples you gave I think are really illustrative of, of a broader point so you talked about the East India Company and then you talked about basically examples for when the US was a much more frontier nation mm -hmm. right and that ties into what you're saying because if you listen to what we're saying like you, you just said it yourself I don't think they could seize the satellites, but when they tried, when they threatened to take the stuff that's literally on the ground, that's what caused you know them to 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 back off. And I think this is really interesting, in particular with SpaceX. Like, <laughs> not to take the science fiction science fiction examples too far, but like look at the examples that are famous. Right? You have Blade Runner. Okay, so Blade Runner, all of the replicants are made by this giant evil corporation. But remember, they're using the replicants to do all this off-planet mining. So they're sort of operating in the frontier where the government presumably can't exert its, its influence. There's no state capacity there. And they have a chokehold on something that everyone on Earth needs, which is whatever, whatever the freaking Rutger Hauer replicants are mining on that. I don't think they ever told us, right? And like alien, like the big bad corporation that's going to harvest the aliens for nefarious purposes like they're operating way off in the middle of space there's nothing around like there's no government there it's like the US in the 1800s you know in in uh, Wells Fargo time like there's no state there so yeah you can have these these corporations that are sort of sources of organization and local power emerge and and do this sort of thing um which is why like I guess I would qualify what I said before and say I'm really skeptical of the notion of like, oh, Microsoft is going to take on the U.S. government. No, they're not. Like that just seems so implausible to me. But I can see where you have interesting conflicts between something like a SpaceX, which is physically operating in a place where maybe like maybe the U.S. would struggle to shut down the satellites. Like maybe they're like th th when you think about space in particular, and this is getting pretty high high flying literally um i think that's an interesting uh, conflict to think about when uh because i could see a plausible case for that uh being a scenario um when you when you get get away from state capacity yeah so we started with fargo on the prairie and fargo in the timber and we end with fargo in space uh, we got to get you out of here for your meeting rob so i'll pick it up there next week <laughs> The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. 
Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.